Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. Joining me is Dr. Paul Cameron. Now, Dr. Cameron was on with us a few weeks ago, and uh, since that time, he contacted me saying that he had received a nice validation relating to the idea that gay parents have uh, a higher preponderance of gay children than do straight parents. Dr. Cameron, let's start with the study. Tell me about it. <coughs> well, this is a follow-on on what I published. As you know, uh, I looked at three narratives by people who were uh, pro-homosexual and they interviewed various kids from, who had had homosexual parents and among the data that they collected were things like uh, what they did sexually, what their sexual preferences and so forth were. And it turned out about a third of them claimed to have a, a homosexual orientation or be interested in homosexual activity or done it. Now this kind of fit with my original data collected in the 80s in which uh, out of a sample of almost 5,000 people we found 17 people who reported a homosexual parent and of those about a third, actually a little bit more than a third, uh, reported that their interests were not exclusively heterosexual. So Dr. Shum out of um, uh, Manhattan, Kansas, uh, University of Kansas there, Kansas State, excuse me, uh, decided to see whether he could replicate my results by going to 10 additional uh, narratives or collections of narratives by investigators. And lo and behold, he basically, publishing in the same journal, the Journal of Biosocial Science, a uh, Cambridge University journal, uh, he found essentially the same thing. And then, as you may be aware, yesterday, online comes a new study by Marx. We have so much information there. I feel like I sure. gave you a good chance to present it all. Uh, I want to focus on the Walter Shum study because that's the one you emailed me about and that I've researched the most extensively. Just a one right. comment on the, the most recent study you mentioned. There's nothing random about people who sign up to participate over the Internet. But let's, let's put that aside for now and focus on the mm -hmm. Walter Shum study. The Walter Shum study is, I can say without a doubt, one of the most bogus studies I've ever even heard of when we talk about what science actually is. And I'll tell you why I think that is, and I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Okay. The Walter Shum study is a meta-analysis. So in theory, it is an analysis of other studies or of other research or of other polls. And like you said, he uses 10 such analyses. Except when you look into what these analyses are, they are narrative books, as you, call, as you call them. For example, Abigail Garner's book, Families Like Mine, Children of Gay Parents Tell It Like It Is. Now, when we look at that book, it's a book where she actually says, I specifically wanted to have half of the children of gay parents uh, be gay children. So she went out and looked for those, okay? So it's not a coit to say that, well, look at that. Look at Abigail's book where half of the children aren't gay and half of the children are gay, that must mean half of, of, the, of the children of gay parents are gay. She went out and said, I want to find this sample. It's, it's completely bogus to then say that therefore those are the numbers, don't you think? If she had said that before she published her book, it's not in her book. I used her book as well as Shum did. And uh, subsequently, she made that kind of a of a statement. I don't know if it's true, of course. Um, uh, let's say it is. Yeah. Uh, the other two did, that I used didn't make that, that claim, as, as the others. Um, uh, what you have here is a great difficulty, and that is there's no way to draw a random sample of people in general, because the refusal rates now are getting astronomical. Uh, we only know what people say and many people are motivated to tell us something other than the unvarnished truth. But Dr. Cameron, so, I think that's, that's not really the point. The point is you're using narrative books about, specifically in some cases, when there are gay children of gay parents. It's like if I said to you, you know what, I'm going to do a meta-analysis of how often airplanes crash. And I told you the books I used were a book about airplane crashes. And I said, you know what, every single flight they describe in that book ended up in a crash. Therefore, 100% of airplanes crash. It's just as bogus. 
I, I don't think it's quite that way. <laughs> okay, how do you think Abigail made this statement, not in her book, if I'd seen that statement, and I'm sure if Shum had seen that statement, uh, we wouldn't have used it in the way we did. Nonetheless, he found other narratives of the same thing. So uh, the problem with any scientist is this. Here you have a very small minority of folk, people who have a homosexual parent. And how do you get data on them? I, I really want to focus on the Shum study, though. And every okay. single one of those 10 books is a narrative that, is, that people are being handpicked by the authors. It's, to call it a study is, is a misnomer. I mean, honestly, uh, it, we've talked about you being kicked out of the American Psychological Association. Is flouting this type of study as legitimate? What got you kicked out of that, Dr. Cameron? Well, first of all, I wasn't kicked out. You can call them, and they, they won't say that. It's, it's really ambiguous. After all, I resigned first. But aside from that... Uh, but you, re you resigned when you were already under investigation, science, which they don't uh, allow, yeah. Uh, the Journal of Biosocial Science is right up there. It's in the top 50 or so of social science publications. They took my study. They took Shum's study. Uh, is it imperfect? Sure. Without. Well, they're all bogus. It's not that they're not perfect. Well, I don't know about bogus, but they're not... Uh, they're stories. They're narratives. It's, it's, it's nonfiction. It's not research. It's just Even the Census Bureau, as you're aware, is now going to using cell phones, random dialogue. My goodness, what is happening here? A uh, part of it is people are tired of being interviewed or, or afraid of being. It. I don't know. Okay, and I think I think we understand. I, is very difficult. We're not going to agree about whether it's legitimate or not. I think I've made my case for why I think it's bogus. The last thing I want to touch on in the last minute or so we have is after your last interview where you admitted to having been sexually abused uh, when, you were a, when you were a child and having Please. had for a time attraction to men, are you aware no, of... I was interested. What I said was I was, int I was intrigued because uh, any three-year-old boy who gets uh, stimulated, um, they get intrigued. Now, I, I have to interrupt man. there, though. I have to interrupt because this is fascinating. Most mm -hmm. people who are abused wouldn't say that they were stimulated. St uh, abuse is a violent act, and to say you were stimulated, that's a sexual term. It's very unusual to describe sexual abuse as actually being something sexual with the word stimulated. Most people would call it violated, injured, hurt, but you call it stimulated. It's very unusual. I don't think so. Of course, I'm an adult now talking about things I remember as a three-year-old. However, when I have interviewed kids who have been molested, uh, I find that they don't use the word stimulated, but they find uh, they use words like, oh, it felt good, and I was ashamed. I was uh, like the Sandusky trial that's going on now. Uh, obviously, many of these kids found some pleasure in it, some guilt in it, some trouble in it. Um, I don't know how many of them at the time felt deeply violated and victimized. Some may have been, but my but question, that Dr. Grows, Cameron, like the Catholic priest situation, uh, that usually grows over time rather than something that a kid says, "My goodness, I was raped." No, but my my question was actually not a, my question was not about that. It was just whether you had heard how viral it went on the internet and how many news sites took an interest in that interview. I'm just curious whether you heard of that. Ah, a few folk contacted us, yes. Oh, okay. And uh, I, I think, uh, somewhat inappropriately so, in that a three-year-old boy only knows a certain amount of things and uh, only has a, a limited number of experiences. That was one of my experiences. I remember uh, being, as I said to you, intrigued, although I wouldn't have used that term at three. Um, and uh, who knows what would have happened? I don't had that kid or a young man, I don't know exactly, um, come over the hill and done it again. Fortunately, he didn't. He went somewhere else, uh, or I wasn't out and available. I don't know. But I do know that I could see in myself that being stimulated in that way, something that little guys don't get, um, uh, made me aware of things that most kids just were oblivious to. All right, Dr. Paul Cameron, uh, thank you for the interview, and I guess we will just have to agree to disagree about the study, but I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. You bet. Okay. All the best.